everyone. Welcome to worship at Cuyahoga Valley Church. I'm so very glad that you are here today. And thank you for welcoming us into your home or wherever you are if you're watching online. My name is Raquel Shores, and I work with CVC Kids. I am the director of BLAST, which is a ministry to the families here. And if you are new or newer to our service today, would you please take a moment right now and let us know you're with us. And you can do that by texting the keyword hello to 440-276-5575. We would like to welcome you personally, and we also have a welcome gift for you, an Amazon gift card that we'd like to send to you to let you know how glad we are that you are joining us today. Now, for those of you that are newer here and you are in the room today, please stop by our guest reception table in the foyer after the service. I will be there, and I would love the opportunity to meet you in person. For anyone, if you would like to submit a prayer request, you can text the keyword PRAY to that very same number, 440-276-5575. Now, if you're with us here today and you're thinking, I don't have the ability to interact with text, that's okay. Um, you can head out to the foyer after the service, and at the information counter, there is a card that has everything you need. You can fill out a prayer request, request to speak with a pastor and let us know that you're new. So you can go there and fill that card out. Now, for those of you who would prefer to pray with a pastor personally in a safe environment, you may visit the umbrella table outside to your right after the service is over. If it's raining, there will be a pastor in room 103 instead. CVC is continuing to ask that you register on a weekly basis for the indoor services. So registration is open right now and available for next Sunday's service, August 9th. And you can do that at our website at cvconline.org. Registration used to close at noon on Saturdays, but now it will go until 9 p.m. on Saturdays. So you can register up until that point. We will continue to offer our, our services online at 9.30 a.m. and at 11 o'clock a.m. And don't forget Church on the Lawn, which takes place, weather permitting, on Sundays through August at 6.30 p.m. Now, today, weather is not permitting. So we'll be offering our 6.30 p.m. service indoors tonight, and you can join in on that by filling out our registration form, which is available now on the website at cvconline.org slash regathering. Finally, our desire is that CVC would be a house of prayer. So we offer currently four opportunities weekly for corporate prayer where we can meet together and pray. All are welcome to join in on this important opportunity. So the times are Sunday at 8 a.m., 9.30, and 11, and also on Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m. All prayer gatherings meet in room 102, and there are also virtual options available. So for more information or to sign up to attend virtually, you can email us at connect at cvconline.org. And now it is time to worship together, so please do stand if you're able. Well, good morning. It's great to, to see you all, to be uh, together. For those of you who are in the room here in person and those of you who are joining us online, we're, we're privileged and uh, joyful to be able to worship together today. Uh, I want to share with you from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Beginning in verse 14, it says, The love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that Christ has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And then going on to verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 
Brothers and sisters, we serve a God who is in the business of taking what was dead uh, and bringing it to life, bringing things out of darkness into the light, transforming these hearts of stone into hearts that are filled with new life. So let's rejoice together in this God who is making things new.
Amen. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we say.
Oh Lord, we, we declare that yours is the, the matchless name. There's no one who is like you. There's, there's no one whose, whose character, whose heart could compare to yours, whose, whose might could match you. We praise you for your holy, you are righteous. Lord, you are set apart from us in your holiness. And we need the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, which you freely provided for us so we could draw near. When you tell us that there's salvation found nowhere else but through him. So God, we thank you for your salvation, for the opportunity to spend some time directing our hearts and eyes towards you and, and your glory and the work that you're doing. Lord, would you bless us this morning, bless our time together. Would your spirit work mightily through Pastor Chad as he preaches from your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can grab a seat. Great to be with you. Those of you in the room, yeah, great to see your faces. And those of you watching online, great to be together wherever you are at. Hey, I'd like to start our time by sharing a small piece of a story of a young woman who comes to church here. And growing up, she did not really go to church. Uh, they popped in at Christmas and Easter like a lot of people do. And uh, she does remember going to confirmation a little bit as a young girl. But really, as she looks over three generations of her family, she can't identify anyone else that she's aware of that made a profession of their faith. And so one day, a student here at our church invited her to CVC Youth, and she started coming, and eventually she gave her life to Christ, which was awesome. And then um, she was hoping that her new faith would be warmly received, or at least understood on some level, by her family. But instead, what started happening was tension started to develop between her family members. Because now, the, the beliefs and the actions and the choices and the morals of the girl that they used to know were no longer aligned with who they knew. And so instantly, there started to become more tension in her home. Her mother just can't relate to her faith. And she feels like Jesus took her little girl. Uh, her father is a very um, strong agnostic, and he just believes pretty much any faith in a God is pretty foolish. She has a very strong, outspoken, atheistic grandfather, who when they're together, a lot of times she gets on the end of his hostility, and his hostility originates because he had a bad experience in a church growing up, and so now she's the, the, I guess the brunt of that. She's got one brother who's a very um, strong atheist, and a lot of times he verbally attacks her for her faith in Christ. And she's got another brother who's, who's kind of open to the faith, but he's not really listening because of the influence of all the other families. And so some of the mistreatment and tension she gets, it might be as simple as an eye roll or uh, you know, a huff or puff of muttering words under breath. Sometimes it's flat out attack against her intelligence and against her character. You know, she got baptized out of her love for Christ and she didn't even feel like she could invite her family to her baptism because of the backlash that she would get for her faith. You know, the young woman has literally heard from her loved ones that her devotion to Jesus is idiotic and pathetic. This young woman has to now navigate the constant tension that her faith in Jesus has provoked with her family. And my suspicion is, as I read some of her story, some of you can relate to it. Some of you have had similar experiences maybe with some of your loved ones in your family. Well, here's why. Here's why she's experiencing this treatment. Here's why I've experienced this with some of my family and friends. And here's why some of you have experienced it with some of your family and friends. Here's the reason. Because believing in Jesus guarantees you peace with God, but it does not guarantee you peace with other people. 
It'll guarantee you a peace with God, right? But it doesn't guarantee you peace with other people. In fact, we're going to open up our Bibles here in a second to the book of Luke chapter 12. And we're going to look at a passage where Jesus basically says that if we choose to follow him, it will cause division with our own family members. So what do we do? Like, we know this is a concept, but I just want to tell us, what do we need to do in light of that? Here's what we need to do. We need to stand on our peace with God, even when we don't have peace with people. And by the way, when I say people, I'm uh, specifically speaking to unbelievers. The division that's caused between those who have made a profession of faith and will follow Christ and those who haven't. And so we can stand on our peace with God when we don't have peace with people. So with that, I invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 12. So if you're home, get open your Bibles or fire up your Bible apps right here in the room, same thing. And we're going to be in the book of Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 49. And we're just going through verse 53 because what we're going to look at is hard to digest. And we're just going to take it in with those verses and not, you know, keep teaching too much more after that. And so if you're new to the Christian faith or you're seeking or checking it out, uh, the book of Luke is one of four books in the Bible referred to as the Gospels. And there are four accounts that record the life and the ministry and the teachings of Jesus. And so we're going to look at this teaching of Jesus, which is very tough, but we're not going to put a filter over it. We're not going to try to dilute it. We're going to have to stare it in the face and say, what did he mean when he said this? So here we go. Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 49. And these are the words of Jesus. He said, I came to cast fire on the earth and wood that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I've come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather, what's the word? Division. For from now on in one house, there will be five divided. Three against two, two against three. They will be divided. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and her daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And let's pray. Lord, we look at your word. We know it's perfect. We know it's holy. We know it's indestructible. And God, there's times in your word that we feel comforted and we feel a great peace. There's other times we're confused or we <clears throat> are curious. And Lord, this is a very vexing passage. And so Jesus, help us to know a little bit more about what you said and why you said it and how we can walk on this earth and light of it until we see you face to face and get a full understanding. So Lord, open up our minds, open up our hearts. I pray for those who don't know you that today you would even use this kind of a passage to give them a greater understanding of your righteousness, your holiness, and your invitation to have a new life in Christ. So even use this passage to woo them and romance them to your heart, a heart that loves uh, your children fiercely. In Jesus' name. We all said? Amen. Amen. I want to focus on three key words in this text. And I think understanding these three key words will give us a better um, ability to stand on our peace with God when we don't have peace with people, unbelievers specifically. And the first word is we have to understand this word fire. This is an important word. He says, I've come to bring fire. You're like, well, is Jesus a pyromaniac? Like, what is he saying, all right? Okay. Verse 4 says, I've came to cast fire on the earth and wood that it were already kindled. So the fire here can really be looked at in two ways. The first is seen as a reference to the judgment of God. When you study the Bible, when you look at the Bible, a lot of times the concept of fire is used in light of God's judgment in some way, shape, or form. Uh, We know that, you know, fire is a reference to hell. We see fire as a reference to judgment many times in the scriptures. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, God speaks to the apostle Peter. He refers to the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And so on one hand here, fire refers to the judgment that's coming on mankind. And that Jesus' ministry of his preaching and teaching was going to result in those who would accept him and those who would reject him. And those who reject him eventually are going to be consumed eternally for this fire because of their rejection. And him desiring that it would be kindled was his desire that the justice and judgment would come and be fulfilled. But on the other hand, fire can mean something else. When we look at this man named John the Baptist, John the Baptist was a man who came and was preparing people for the entrance of Jesus into his ministry, his teaching and preaching. 
And John the Baptist referred to the ministry of Jesus this way. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and what? Fire. So another way to understand the fire that Jesus is longing for and wanting to be kindled is it's the fire of the Holy Spirit. That's what we see. And so when we study the the book of Acts, for example, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell on the early church, it says that the room was full of a sound like the rushing of wind, and then something that looked like tongues of what? Fire came and rested upon the disciples, and then they went out and boldly proclaimed the gospel. So another way to understand the fire is that Jesus came to set that fire of the Holy Spirit on the early church so that they would be inflamed and go to do the will and the work of God. No wonder he longed for that fire to get lit, right? But here's here's the reality for us as believers. We can understand that either way, whatever he's saying, it's good for the believers, Because when we look at this passage, it can help us stand on our peace with God, even when we don't have peace with people, because first, we've been rescued from the coming fire. And so when we hear this fire, we're like, whoo, man, I can stand on the peace of God because that fire is not going to hurt me. And so we rejoice with that. And and then second, now we have this indwelling presence of God, the Holy Spirit that's sealed us with the pledge. We're his. We're God's child. Uh, We've been moved from being a child of wrath to a child of God. And now this fire of God burns in us and uses us. And so either way, the believer comes out on top, which helps us stand in peace in our relationship with God, even though, man, we experience some really difficult situations with people, even people we love. So what can a person do for us in comparison? Like what person can shield you from the judgment of God? What person can prevent you from the coming wrath and judgment? No one. What person can fill you with the knowledge of God and fill you with the Holy Spirit? No one. And so at the end of the day, we're going to choose Jesus. We're going to choose Jesus. So at least I can rest in the peace of knowing that I'm in good hands now and for eternity, and that can help me stand in my presence and peace with the Lord now, even though it may cost me some peace with some people I love dearly. And so understanding the word fire can help us stand in our peace with God when we don't have peace with people. The second key word is this word baptism. Baptism is very important in our faith. When we get baptized, it's our way of saying we love Jesus, we're committed to Jesus, and that we follow Jesus. If you have professed faith as a a believer in Christ, uh, you get baptized. That's out of obedience, that's out of love. But Jesus is talking about a baptism that he still has to undergo. And some of you are thinking, wait, didn't he get baptized by John the Baptist back to kick off his ministry? Yeah. So what's he talking about? This baptism that Jesus is referring to in verse 50 when he says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it's accomplished is a reference to his suffering and his crucifixion. It's going to be an immersion in suffering as he dies on the cross for the sins of humanity. This is the baptism that he has looking forward to. No wonder it's causing him distress. But, don't you, but just a kind of side note, don't you love the fact that even Jesus, who's God and man, was feeling distressed? Like sometimes we kind of get this like rainbow puking unicorn view of Christianity that we're never supposed to feel any fear and anxiety ever. No, that fear and anxiety is conquered in Christ, but even Jesus was distressed at the baptism that was coming. And the fire of the Spirit wasn't going to happen, and the fire that was going to come for judgment wasn't going to happen until this baptism took place. So Jesus knew that he was committed to fulfill his divine mission to go to the cross for our benefit. He knew that it was going to be necessary for him to suffer and to die on the cross so that we could be made right with God, that we could be in relationship with God and be forgiven of our sin. Um, I think it's very important when, when we think about the cross, this symbol that a lot of us wear or have places in our home. You've got to remember, the, the cross is not a tragedy. The cross means victory. Right? And so Jesus knew that this baptism was going to be a victory that was coming. And knowing, knowing that my right relationship with God, knowing that my forgiveness of sins, knowing that, that whatever um, sin has broken in my life, God can actually restore through his power. Uh, when you realize that it's humbling, And it's awesome, and it draws us into a worshipful, intimate relationship with the living God. And this understanding that Jesus was going to 
experienced anguish and suffering on the cross on our benefit helps me stand in my peace with God when I don't have peace with people because the suffering that Jesus did for us has rescued us from the suffering that we were destined for. Like this is a misunderstanding we always have to hit. The Bible doesn't teach that we're all good and we're all going to heaven. Quite the contrary. The Bible says we're all bad. We're sinners. We are destined to hell. Like if, if there's a freeway, everybody's on it and it's going to hell because we're rebellious. We don't want God in our life. And then God says, I have provided an off-ramp for you. And the off-ramp is the cross where my son died so you don't have to go. And so the mindset of like, well, God's so mean, he provided an off-ramp, Right? But there's division between those who stay on the highway and those who choose to go off the ramp. But just the realization that Jesus suffered so that I wouldn't have to suffer puts me at peace with him. But it's going to cost me peace with others when I believe that. So how that helps me is that in comparison to whatever suffering I experience here on earth, whether um, actions or words from others, pales in comparison to the suffering I was going to experience in eternity. And so when we know, like we know like one day when this life is over, we're going home. We're going home with the Lord. And we're not going to be in a place of suffering. Like just the understanding of that helps, it, helps me to suffer better here because he suffered for me. And so our family members are awesome and we love them and we don't want them um, to undergo that baptism of suffering. <laughs> but they did not undergo a baptism of suffering on our benefit they did not die on the cross for our sins. Jesus did. So if I'm going to be put in a position to either choose to be at peace with my family but at odds with God or at peace with God knowing it might cost me to be at odds with my family, that's a no-brainer when I bowed my head and my heart to Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And it's not that I want division. It's not that I want to have uh, you know, conflict between us. I just know there's going to be. But because he suffered for me, it's a cost we're willing to pay because of what Jesus did. So as hard as it is, as sad as it is that my family and friends don't know Christ yet, at least I can rest in the peace of knowing that Jesus suffered so I don't have to. And it just makes any earthly suffering that I experience pale in comparison. And just a note on that baptism. If you haven't got baptized and you're a follower of Christ, like, it's just time. Like, giddy up. Let's go. All right? Um, whatever excuses, whatever reasons, whatever delays have blocked you, just don't do it. We're going to be doing some baptisms this month. And we're going to be um, getting ready to do more baptisms. So if you have a relationship with Christ and you haven't been baptized yet, just go online, cvconline.org slash baptism. Sign up. Let's get you baptized so you can express your love and commitment to the Lord. And so understanding this word fire, understanding this word baptism kind of helps us live our peace out with God, even though we know it might not um, lead us to have peace with people who don't believe. The third word is the word division. We've got to look at this word division because it's where the tension lies. It's the trigger word of this moment. Verse 51, Jesus said, do you think that I've come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. But doesn't this seem like a contradiction? Because some of us are Bible students, and here's what we're thinking. Wait a minute. In Isaiah, it talks about the Messiah, the one who's coming one day. He's going to be the Prince of Peace. And then, and then Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, opens up with the Christmas story. And in the Christmas story, it talks about when, when, when the birth of Christ happened, the angels were rejoicing and said, peace on earth to all men. Uh, you look in Ephesians chapter 6 and it talks about the armor of God and it talks about the gospel of peace. So is this a contradiction? No, because you have to understand there are different ways to understand peace. There are different types of peace that can be referenced to. Now, the peace that Jesus was referring to here had to do with the mindset that his original audience had, the Jewish frame of mind, that one day God was going to send a Savior, a Messiah. And when he came... He was going to bring literal, physical peace on earth, meaning he was going to overthrow the enemies of Israel. He was going to bring everyone back to God, and then he was going to eliminate injustice on earth forever, a physical, lasting peace. Is that going to happen? Yes, that is going to happen eventually. So their mindset is when Savior comes, it's a done deal. But what they don't realize is that's what's going to happen at the second coming of Messiah. 
The one who came, lived, died, rose, ascended, left, is coming back. And when he comes back, that is the peace he's going to usher in. A physical peace where God's with man. Judgment. No more injustice. No more pain. And there'll be a, a physical, literal, eternal peace that we're going to experience. But the first coming of Messiah, the first coming of the Savior, was to be a suffering servant who was going to atone for the sins of mankind. And the thing was, and you can kind of see these in the verses that follow, he had to do that first. So the people wanted the dessert without having the meal, right? He's like, look, the dessert's coming, but you got to still have the meal first. And, but they didn't want that. They didn't see it. And so that's why they rejected Jesus the Messiah, because he didn't bring that kind of peace that they were waiting for that eventually is going to come. And so when he says, do you think I'll bring peace? He's thinking, no, no, no. I didn't come bring peace right now. No, it's, it's actually going to cause division. My coming, my teaching, my inviting you into relationship is actually going to bring division. But the peace you're looking for is going to be experienced by those down the road who come to know me as Savior. And so this is what he's getting to. Now, for those who have responded to faith in Christ, we do have peace. And there's different kinds, right? So we have peace with God. Let's make it very clear. The Bible teaches before you come to Christ, you are an enemy of God. You're at war. My way. No, my way. My way. No, my way. Doesn't sound like a two-year-old and a parent, right? Okay. And that's the kind of relationship we have. We're, we're, we're at enmity. And so when you give your life to Christ, no more war. You have peace with God. Read that in Romans 5, right? We move from being a child of wrath to a child of God. And your identity now is a child of God. You've got peace with God. You also have peace, in, peace inside you. The shalom that the Bible talks about, right? And so Jesus says, my peace I give to you, right? He says that in John chapter 14. I give you my peace. We know in Philippians it talks about the, in Christ we have a peace that passes understanding. And so even though there's chaos going around the world, we don't freak out. Why? Because we have shalom. We've got the peace of God inside of us. We also know that we have peace with other believers. Our common faith unites us with believers all over the world. Men and women all over the globe are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And even though we have very different cultures and have diff very different backgrounds and very different perspectives, we're one family. We're one giant blended family in the name of Christ, which is so beautiful. And even if you look at the inner circle of Jesus, and I'll probably talk about this in the near future, but like you even look at the inner circle, you've got all these ruffian fishermen, you've got you know, a couple business guys, you've got Matthew, a tax collector, which is like the bottom of the barrel culturally, right? And you've got Simon the Zealot, whose answer is just stab everything that doesn't agree with you. Think about the tension between Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector. Like I'm wondering if Jesus had to stop Simon from chasing Matthew around the fire with his dagger, Right? But he brought them to a place of peace. Even in his own inner circle, we have peace with other believers. But we can have this peace, of good, peace with God, peace of God, peace with other believers, but you're going to have division with unbelievers who don't understand and who reject the message of Christ. And so we need to think about this. It's not that the gospel creates division so much. It's that people's opposition to the gospel that will create division. The gospel is a message. It's the rejection of the message that's causing the division. Jesus is saying here that division will be the effect of his coming. Not that that's the purpose of his coming. And so allegiance to Jesus will cause division with many unbelievers, even those inside our home. Uh, even verse 52, look at that. It says, starting now. For from now on. So even as Jews were coming to faith in Christ, it was causing divisions. And if you think about the division that a Jewish person um, experienced when they said, I think Jesus is the Messiah. They a lot of times got um, banned from their family, banished from their family, banished from their village sometimes. You couldn't go to synagogue, which was not only just church, but the hub of community in the village. And you would be pushed away from that. And so this is what early Jewish believers would experience when they came to Christ. And we see similar experiences today all around the world as people come to Christ. Everything from the young woman whose story I was telling in the beginning to our brothers and sisters in Christ in Asia and the Middle East when they come to faith in Christ and what they experience. A lot of you know that we've adopted an unreached people group in Indonesia um, at an island that we refer to as Pearl Island. 
And we have some folks that work there. We send missionaries there. We're translating a Bible in the language of those people. So we hear stories that come out of this context of people who've come to faith from that background. The island is, is Muslim. It's like 99% Muslim, right? And so if a person comes out of that background, it's going to cost them a division with a lot of their family, even their life probably. And so I was talking to our missionary who's on that island. And he was sharing with me several stories of what happens for some of these people. These are common experiences, by the way, what I'm about to tell you. This isn't like, ooh, that's a rare one. It's like, well, that happened again. But he told me a story of a man named Josh. That's not really his name, but that's the name we're giving him. Um, the Josh went into business with another man on the island. And they had like a 50-50 partnership, okay? We're going to sell things, 50-50 partnership. Well, what happened was Josh started taking more money. And his partner knew about it. But his partner didn't confront him. He didn't, you know, challenge him. He didn't threaten him. He didn't retaliate. He just let him. Well, Josh knew that the partner knew. And after a while, that was really bugging Josh. And he got upset. And so he sat down with his partner and said like, hey, why are you letting me do this? Like, I know you know I'm taking more money than we agreed to. Why are you letting me do this? Well, the man was able to share with Josh that he was a follower of Christ. And he just felt like his relationship with Josh was more important than the money he was losing. And instead of causing conflict with him, he wanted to stay close to him and continue to build a relationship with him. Mind blower, right? Well, eventually Josh gave his life to Christ because of that, that man's witness and his constant sharing of the gospel. Well, as Josh became a believer, eventually his family found out. One day Josh went home. And shortly after he came home, a truck pulled up to his village home. And out of that truck poured cousins and uncles and relatives. And they stormed into the home and they grabbed Josh. And they took him and put him in a chair in the room. They put a large knife on each side of his neck and they were going to kill him for his faith in Christ. Not exactly something we can relate to, right? By the grace of God, Josh's father came into the room and said, Look, if you're going to kill my son, you have to kill me first. And his father wasn't even a believer, but he loved his son. And so the relatives relented for the moment. Well, Josh knew his life was in danger, so he fled the island. He just had to leave. He left for a season. Eventually, he came back. He's able to peacefully go back to his village, and he's been sharing Christ with his father ever since. May God use Josh's testimony to win his father's love to the father. Right? That's, dude, that's division, Right? This is division that we're talking about, and this is a common experience. Even Jesus experienced division in his home over his own identity, remember? Like, if you look at the life of Jesus in his early ministry, if you, if you look at John chapter 7, verse 5, it says that his brothers didn't believe him. And John 7, 5 says that the brothers of Jesus, because, you know, Mary and Joseph had other kids, right? And so the brothers, the half-brothers, technically of Jesus, they didn't believe in Jesus, all the things he was saying. In fact, in the book of Mark, uh, chapter 3, verse 21, it says that they thought he was crazy. They said he's out of his mind. He's crazy. So he, Jesus isn't telling us something that he didn't even experience himself. Following Christ is going to bring to vision. Matthew 12, 30, Jesus said, whoever's not with me is against me. Look, anyone who's going to say, if you're not with me, is against me, instantly is going to cause division. There's no middle ground with Jesus. There's no neutral. You're either with him or against him. And some of you are like, well, I don't really believe in Jesus. I'm just not, I just don't follow him. Jesus has made it clear. To do nothing with Jesus is defaulting to being against him. You have to be with him. You have to be for him. And so this understanding of the word division helps me Stand in my peace with God, even when I don't have peace with people, because it makes me aware. Like, it's like, maybe we should start meeting with people, like, is there like, hey, I want to give my life to Christ. We need to say, like, okay, that's great. But before you do, let's talk. <laughs> you need to be prepared for some of the division this may cause in your family if you love Jesus. You just need to know that may happen. Hopefully it doesn't, but you may experience that. And by the way, I want to be clear here. The division that Jesus is using in this text is about the division a believer will experience with an unbeliever when they come to faith. It's not division between believers. Do not hijack this text to, to, to be rude to your unbelieving family or unbelieving friends, and definitely not to try to reinforce division between brothers and sisters in Christ. If you study the Bible, what does Jesus want between his family? Unity wholeness, togetherness. 
And so this is not a text that's speaking to like division over worship preferences or tradition or minor doctrinal issues or COVID theories or whatever it is. We need to do better at being unified. The world needs to see a unified, loving body of Christ that says, hey, we're different, but we love each other and we're united. And honestly, we're not doing that too well right now. And so this is, a dis- this is a division between believers and unbelievers. This is not division with people over non-gospel issues. It's believing the gospel that will cause the division. So the fire that has come in the spirit, the fire that's coming in judgment, the baptism of the suffering of Jesus that he endured and knowing that my devotion to Jesus will cause division with some relationships, all these things give me confidence to stand on my peace with God even though I may not have peace with those who don't believe what I believe. Now I want to go back to the young woman that I shared her story about. I just said, hey, share, share with me a little bit more about how you navigate that. How do you deal with this? Here's a few thoughts that she shared. She said, every day I walk into my house, I'm reminded that the division Christ promises that is prevailing in my family is a mission field and even further, a race he has given me to run to teach me how to love when met with vicious personal attacks. She says, the gospel is offensive and it makes the love we are called to pour out that much more critical and the command to obey a non-believing mother and father second only to God that much more instrumental. I just said, well, how do you deal with it? What's that look like? She said, well, praying before I interact with my family members and in the midst of tension, just going to prayer and asking God for help and seeking out Christian fellowship with close friends who will hear my frustration. They'll empathize with my tears about my unsaved family, but they point me back to Christ. And what he teaches about loving people in the face of persecution. And she says, I ask God every single day to bring my family members to Christ. What great insights from this brave young woman. These are people who don't have the faith you have. Uh, I want to give you four action steps of how to do that. Like, that's a great concept. Stand, okay, I'll do it. How do I do that? Four simple action steps. (laughs) Simple to say, maybe less simple to live out. But these are what I think we can do in light of what I just shared with you. First, love well. Love well. Be loving to your unbelieving family and friends. Let Christ's love for his enemy be your love you have for your family and friends. Let his love flow through you. Love them well. Do not give them margin for accusation or retaliation because you're not loving. With your words, your actions, just love well. Everyone say love well. well. All right. Endure much. You're going to be mocked. You might be ignored. You may be left out. You may receive hostile treatment through your words or actions. Uh, But just like Jesus endured the cross for our benefit, endure their um, mistreatment of you because actually it may be a witness in the long run. Endure much. Give reasonable arguments to support your faith. Like do some study. You can speak reasonably about why you believe what you believe. Give a testimony of why you believe in God and what he's doing in your life. But do not retaliate. Think about our brothers and sisters like Josh in Pearl Island. Think about what they have to endure and go, if they can endure that, I'm pretty sure I can endure what I'm experiencing too. So love well, endure much. Everyone say endure much. Yes, even you watching online. Third, pray often. Pray often. Convert your pain, your sadness, your hurt, your worry for the soul of your loved one to prayer. Pray for your loved one's often, that they would know Christ. Uh, you might not see this while you're here in the room, but we've got a wall. If you've been to CVC, you know there's a wall uh, with who's your one. We've got names written on that wall. Some of you at home have bookmarks or sitting on your fridge right now or in your Bible right now. You can see it. And a lot of the names on our one cards or on the wall are names of family members, right? We've got to keep praying for them, that God would bring them over the line so that they would come to faith in him. So everyone pray often. Everyone say pray often. So love well, endure much, pray often, and fourth, hope always. Hope always. Remember, the brothers of Jesus did not believe in him. But if you fast forward to after the resurrection, you'll see a moment after the ascension that they're all in one room, and they're waiting for the Holy Spirit, and there's the disciples, and there's some faithful women of faith. Guess who else is in that room? The brothers of Jesus. 
In fact, James, one of his half-brothers, when he wrote the book of James, refers to his half-brother Jesus this way. He says, hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. James went from this dude is off his rocker to he's the Lord of glory. You know what that says for us? Anybody can come to faith. Anybody can come to faith. Hope always. Some of you have been praying for lost ones for decades. Keep praying. Keep hoping. So love well. Endure much. Pray often. Hope always. That's how we can walk this out. And by the way, if you're, if you're watching, you're listening, or you're here in this room, and you don't have a relationship with Christ, our hope for you is that you can experience this love that God has for you. Well, how do you, how do you get there? It's, it's really simple. You just pray and talk to God. And in that, you do three things. You admit that you're a sinner and that you're far from him and broken. You profess a belief in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and that his death on the cross was for you and his resurrection from the grave was for you. And you believe that. And then you commit your life to following him. And so as a response step for anyone who needs to receive Christ, you want to receive Christ, you have received Christ today, you want to talk to a pastor you need to walk this out a little bit. We want to connect with you. So just text us the word connect. It's super simple. Get your phone out. If this is a need that you have and text the word connect to 440-276-5575. We'd love to help you take whatever your next best step is. Also, just a reminder that this young woman who came to CVC and came to faith, the gospel message that's going around Pearl Island, a lot of this is possible because of your faithfulness here at CVC. You're praying, you're serving, and you're giving. So thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for giving here to this ministry. Thank you for serving and praying. It's making a difference. Keep it up. So if you haven't had a giving moment this week, make sure you have that right now. Text it, go online, use your app to give the ministry to CVC. And keep, keep praying that people will come to faith in Christ. Well, as we move to our response time, I want to go back to the baptism of Jesus' peace, his death on the cross, his resurrection. We haven't had a chance to do Lord's Supper in a while together, so we're going to do Lord's Supper here. Those of us in the room have been given a very uh, nifty little prepackaged um, aid to help us. If you're home, hopefully you got the email to just say, here's how to kind of make this moment happen in your home. Maybe you have some fresh, warm bread, nice little thing of grape juice, or maybe you're scrambling right now for like a saltine and water. It works. It's okay. <laughs> um, we want to come back to just saying thank you to the baptism of suffering that Jesus went so that we can have a relationship with God. We can have forgiveness of sins. We can have intimacy with God. And so I encourage you that wherever you're at, whether you're in this room, go ahead and take that bread out. If you're online, get that bread out. Just remember that uh, this wafer is a symbol that represents the body of Christ that was beaten and bruised and hung on a cross, that we can have relationship with him. And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, at home, wherever you're at, right here in the room, let's take and eat together, the body of Christ. You also have juice, the cup, whatever you can get your hands on at home if you're doing this last minute. This little glass of liquid represents the most powerful substance known to man. The blood of Christ that washes away the sin of the world. Every regret, every humiliation, everything we would want no one to ever know about us. But God knows. He washed it away on the cross with the blood. And so we remember Jesus until he returns. And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, take the blood of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time that we could have together. Sweet fellowship in hundreds of homes all over Northeast Ohio and even some other states. Some time here together, face to face, which is challenging, but we're grateful for. God, we're so thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus. So Lord, we're filled with joy that we can say we're forgiven, to say that we don't have to endure the suffering of hell. So grateful that Jesus took our pain on our behalf. Lord, we do ask for help 
for the suffering that we endure here. We have family, we have friends, we have coworkers, we have neighbors, we have people in our lives that will attack us with their words and their actions and they'll, they'll bring hostility and they'll neglect. They'll do whatever it takes, Lord, just because they don't understand. Help us to love them well, Lord. Give us thick skin to endure much. Give us a, a, a fire, a passion to pray often for them and to always hope that that hope will never burn out as we live for you. So God, we love you. We worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all said together, amen.
we sing and, and declare in our hearts that your name is holy, that you are the Lord God Almighty, the King over all creation, the one whom every, every knee one day will bow before. So Lord, we, we join in in that song of eternity now and confess who you are and our desperate need of you. Lord, we ascribe, Lord, we, we declare that all blessing, strength, honor, glory, and power are yours. God, I thank you for this morning. Would we be found in you? Would our hearts, Lord, be surrendered to you and your desires, your will? Lord, give us strength to be firm, firmly planted in your truth, the foundation of the gospel not to be swept aside by, by passing things. Lord, we rest in you. Let us be found in you. Would you be glorified in our lives and our hearts as we, yeah, as we live in, in the lost world around us. May we be a testimony to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, for those of you in the room, I'll invite you to take a seat. The ushers are going to come forward and uh, dismiss everyone by row. Uh, but whether you're in the building here or online, we're glad to have you joining with us today in the worship of our great and mighty King. Would you go in the peace of the Lord?